Welcome to this special edition of Sailing Gargoyle. We've just returned from six weeks in the Galapagos Islands. And we are getting a lot of questions. Do you need an agent? How much did it cost? What's the check-in process like? How intense is the hull inspection? So to help answer those questions, we pulled together all of the information that we collected and submitted to go to the Galapagos Islands. We've put it together in an easy format to follow, and we're going to walk through that as well as answer the frequently asked questions. So if you like this video, please let us know, and also please subscribe. So check it out. a bucket list uh, destination that's within easy reach of us, uh, the Galapagos Islands. <laughs> can't believe it's already been four months since we made this decision. It's crazy. It was, it was a great decision. Galapagos are definitely a bucket list item. Uh, well, what we found in preparing for the Galapagos Islands, though, is that we needed to do a lot of research and find out exactly how much it was going to cost and what documents had to be filled out to get a permit. The one thing we found, though, that we needed to start the whole process was that no matter what, you definitely need an agent to walk you through the requirements, the process, and the permits. So to find an agent, we went online. We did research through Google and Noonsight. We looked at the reviews of agents. There are quite a few agents out there, and you have quite a few choices. But we found one, Javier, that we think did a fabulous job for us. We got your email with the fumigation um, sample letter. I noticed there was a specific requirement for COVID uh, fumigation. And yes, if the government they, there, they have a specification for, I mean, they have a specific chemical, mm -hmm. which is authorized by the <clears throat> government there, yeah. you can use that to clean the bottom. We have two options. You can do it by yourself. We can hire a Diver, a local diver. Uh, of course, it has an extra cost. <laughs> you know that you are only two people on board, and it's very risky to do it on the open sea. After our call with Javier, we felt very confident that he was the agent for us, and that's very important when you're selecting an agent for the Galapagos. You're going to be chatting with your agent a lot prior to your departure with many, many questions, and then once you reach the Galapagos, you're going to be chatting with them pretty much daily. They arrange most of your excursions or they'll have the contacts for it. Anything from garbage disposal to restaurant recommendations. So try to find an agent that you get along with really well. <laughs> Our number one question that we had going into the trip to the Galapagos and also the number one question and confusion we see from other cruisers is... How much does it cost? <laughs> so the key to getting an accurate cost is, again, working with your agent you're going to submit information to the agent that will help him to give you a performa, which is an estimate of all of the costs broken down. Now, the information you provide is very basic. It'd be your registration information, uh, the tonnage of the vessel, the length of stay that you're looking for, the number of ports you plan to visit, how many people are on the boat, how many children are on the boat, because there are different prices for children. Will you need to take on fuel in the islands? Very simple questionnaire. When you take that and turn it around, your agent will then send you the performa and it will break down all of the costs for private services, for the government services, the permits and those types of fees for the national parks, and then miscellaneous costs as well. Uh, so we're going to walk through the performa from Gargoyle so you can get an idea of the costs that we incurred getting the permitting for our trip to the Galapagos. Take a look at the details of the performer for Gargoyle. I'm not going to read all of this to you. We will post these on our website at sbgargoyle.com if you'd like to check those out as well. Uh, the private service, as I said, and this runs down for uh, two people aboard Gargoyle. So these are the representative costs. A couple of things to call out as you're reading these. You'll see that there is a representation fee for three different ports. 
uh, Rec Bay, Villamil, and Porta Aora. A representation fee means that you will have a representative from your agency that will be there when you have the officials aboard. They'll have all of your documentation prepared in advance. They'll help and make sure the Zarpays are there and ready to be delivered as well. Uh, so a fantastic service that they offer. Uh, another thing that you will notice on here is that the fumigation services and certification that they offer, uh, we did not take that on because we were in Nicaragua. We had the boat certified for both pests as well as for COVID in Nicaragua. So there was no charge for us for that. Uh, and then the uh, final item there, fuel permits. So if you do wish to take on fuel, you may only take fuel aboard in Rec Bay and that fuel then will be delivered to your boat in large jerry cans. Just make sure that you have a transfer pump or a hose to transfer the fuel from the large jerry cans into your tanks. So for us, you'll see our total cost for the private services came to $1,235. Second set of fees on the Performa will be the government fees. And the government fees are the fees that will vary based around your vessel and the number of passengers. So let's take a look at the Performa. You'll see your international port captain's fee is based on your vessel's gross registered tonnage. In our case, 15 tons, which brings our cost to $150. You'll also see that you have migratory cards, national park entrance fees, national park technical inspections, and you'll see all of those are based around the number of individuals. Note that children do get a significant discount under 12. Uh, the total cost then brings this to $765 for the government fees. This brings our total for our Performa for both the government services as well as the private services to exactly $2,000 in Gargoyle's case. Our agent requires 50% up front before he puts in the permit and then the additional 50% a few weeks later before we departed for the Galapagos Islands. Note that you do need to do your application two full months in advance of arriving in the Galapagos Islands. Beyond the items that we've already touched upon for the permit application, you will require the following. Proof of AIS with an MMSI number, your proof of VHF radios, copies of the usual paperwork, boat registration, etc., last 10 ports of calls, and of course, your cats need up-to-date vaccination and health records. You have sent off all of your documentation and all of your money to the agent, but unfortunately, the costs don't end there. So let's go over some of the pre-departure costs that we had on Gargoyle. These pre-departure costs include the hull cleaning as well as the fumigation for the boat. We also had additional testing for COVID for the crew and a COVID fumigation for the boat. And the tally came up to $720. Now we'll touch base on some of the costs that you will incur while you're there. You have two kinds of costs. You'll have a few other mandatory costs once you're there, uh, but then the rest will be optional based around what you want to do. So taking a look at the remaining mandatory fees that you'll have to pay in the Galapagos. As you move around amongst the islands, you will have to pay for inner island Zarpays, $20 each, depending upon how often you move around or how many ports. You'll have to do an exit Zarpe, and then of course you'll have to pay for your immigration stamp and your passport. That's it for mandatory costs. To the fun costs, and the largest cost that we had when we were in the Galapagos is of course tours. Um, a little unique for us, there was limited amount of tourists on the islands, um, so we didn't have a lot of negotiability, and we actually had limited tours that we could go on. Um, so when it came to tours, we took every tour that we could get our hands on, basically. Uh, we would recommend taking the tours. You're in the Galapagos, you're only there once. Um, but you can control how much you spend based around what you do that doesn't require a tour guide versus what does require a tour guide. So here's a list of the tours that we took. I don't know, Carla, what would you say was your favorite tour of the group? Uh, my favorite was probably Bartolome Island, um, then Española, and Kicker Rock. Those are my faves. Yeah, I would, I would agree with those. Bartolome uh, was especially memorable because of all of the sharks that we saw when we were snorkeling. Uh, the other one, though, that I thought was fabulous and points out that you don't have to spend a ton of money was a self-guided tour of the Wall of Tears. Really the only cost for that was to rent bicycles. The bicycles were fantastic, in great shape, 
uh, easy ride up to the Wall of Tears and back, and we actually saw tortoises in the wild. We saw marine iguanas all over the place. We could stop where we wanted to. That was a fantastic tour. It cost us all of $9 for that. And there are a lot of places that you can walk to, a lot of wildlife that you can see, snorkeling that you can do, free of charge on all the islands. So we also wanted to give you just a rough idea of what some of the other costs would be when you're in the Galapagos Islands. The first one is water taxis. They discourage you from using your dinghy in any of the ports, so you will have to use the water taxis. They will cost a dollar to two dollars per person. Really affordable and they're very accommodating while you're there in port. Uh, restaurants. We love to eat out and we enjoy it. Uh, you can go anywhere from the standard menu del dia, which is the menu of the day or lunch of the day. You know, four to five dollars depending on the location per person. You get three courses and it's fantastic. So the best deal in the islands. Then of course, the Galapagos are a high-end tourist destination. So you can find restaurants that will cost you significantly more. In our videos, you saw us eat at Midori, a sushi restaurant. That was a higher end restaurant. I'd say it was about $30 a person for our meals there as well. Provisioning. We did all of our provisioning in Nicaragua because we, from our research, found out the provisioning would be expensive in the Galapagos. So we left with about three months on the boat. Um, local vegetables, fruit, eggs are very affordable because they're all locally sourced on each island. Um, so that was great. But once you get outside of that and start looking for you know, non-perishable foods, expect it to be pricey. And talking about pricey, the one thing we didn't talk about yet is alcohol. So drinks in the bars and restaurants can be very expensive. And then when you go in a store or market and you wish to buy a bottle of wine, expect to pay $20 or more uh, just for a basic bottle of wine. That's not including the higher end liquors. So stock up if you're a beer or wine drinker, for sure. Absolutely. So when we tallied everything up from a cost perspective to do the performa, to get our permits, all of the fees, and then all of our optional costs for tours and restaurants, etc., our total bill came to $5,000 for six weeks in the Galapagos. That was actually right at what we had budgeted for the trip as well. We've been through all of the costs. We've given you a breakdown of what it looks like to go to the Galapagos Islands, but now we want to do a little Q&A. We have questions that we've gotten that we wanted to address. So we're going to go back and forth with these. And the first question, Carla, for you is, how intense is the check-in process? Uh, it's a little intense, um, but this is where your agent is going to really assist you with the entire process. The hull inspection is done first. Then it moves to a nurse coming on board or a doctor coming on board to do the COVID inspection. And once that has been completed, then the real fun begins. And there's approximately 12 people that will come aboard your boat. This includes your agent, environmental officer, police officers, port captain, interpreter. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, we kind of split up and did a two-man team. So I came down below with the environmental and the port captain and walk them through the boat while Kevin stayed upstairs and managed kind of all of the immigration stuff. It actually, I think due to our agent, was relatively organized and within 45 minutes, they had completed all the paperwork and they took off on the water taxi. So it's intense, but the good news is it's relatively short. So kind of a follow-up to that question then, what about food products? Because we've heard that you can't bring certain foods in with you and they'll just throw them overboard. Um, they don't throw them overboard. What they do is they seal them. So if you have any raw beef or raw pork, they will put a label on it that says that you should not be consuming them in the Galapagos Islands. Mm -hmm. Any tips for the hull cleaning inspection? Oh, the hull cleaning inspection. We were worried about the hull cleaning inspection more than anything in going to the Galapagos. We had heard horror stories about it uh, and that they would fail you for barnacles uh, that you had, etc. And it would mean that you go 40 nautical miles offshore, clean it, come back in and get re-inspected. So what we did was we had the boat cleaned the day before we were going to leave Nicaragua. And then the morning of our departure, the gentleman came back and gave it another cleaning before he left just to make sure he hadn't missed anything. 
If I think of any tips, uh, one of the tips we got from another uh, boater as well was make sure if you have a bow thruster to get in and around the bow thruster openings and the bow thruster prop. That's something that many uh, boaters miss. Let's so make sure that is well cleaned. Uh, we did hear as well that you can drag a line down the side of the boat for about 30 minutes, an hour on each side to knock anything loose. And then typically because of the water temperatures there, any growth you're going to get is grassy and usually around the first one foot from the water line down. So nothing deep on the keel. We were very pleased and excited when we got the thumbs ups from the diver when he went down and we passed the cleaning inspection. Uh, there is the option though that you can uh, go offshore and they will come clean it for you, but they do charge you $300 for that, right? And again, it will take you another day. What's the deal with the sea lions? The sea lions are a bit of an issue in Rec Bay, San Cristobal. Um, they are very assertive and they love sleeping on your boat. Gargoyle has a little bit of a sugar scoop on the back and didn't matter what we did, there was always one sleeping on our stern. We did put a gate up so that we didn't have one in the cockpit. So if you do have an open walkway to your cockpit, make sure that you're taking a net or something that you can stop them with so that they don't end up, you know, down below hanging out in your galley. Um, other than that, they were relatively okay. You have to learn to walk around them because they literally lie on the park benches and the sidewalks and beaches all over the Galapagos. Can you depart to the Galapagos before you receive your permit? Uh, actually, we were told that you can. So you apply for the permit two months in advance. However, as it's getting close to that two month period, even though it hasn't been issued yet, because you will have travel time. So if you're coming from the Marquesas, you will be at sea for probably 20 days before you get there. Uh, you can leave early. And if for some reason it's taken longer than the 60 days to process your permit, your agent will then present the application paperwork and work with the local authorities to get you admitted to the islands. Do you need to take a tour for everything or can you do things on your own? You can definitely do things on your own. You can do local snorkeling, local walks on the islands, and you do not need a tour guide. Um, once you step off of San Cristobal or Isabella or Santa Cruz, you will need a tour guide. Um, so if you're going to any of those islands, it will definitely have to be a prearranged tour with one of the park rangers uh, to ensure that you're not impacting the environment or the island during your stay. Can you stop in the Galapagos if you don't have a permit? Uh, actually, you can. There are two options that allow you to stop in the Galapagos. Uh, the first is an emergency stop. So if you do have a mechanical or health emergency while you're in transit and you're near the Galapagos Islands, you can radio into the port authorities and request a 72-hour emergency stop. They will then uh, direct you to either of the two ports, Port Aora or Rec Bay, uh, whichever is closest, and then you'll check in with the Harbor Authority. You will still need to do the government paperwork, though, and you will need an agent, so you will need to find one of the local agents. The other option is, if you are in transit, you can do what's known as a one-port stop. This allows you to go to Rec Bay and only Rec Bay on San Cristobal, check in with the harbor master and the port authorities there, and you can stay for up to seven days in that port at the discretion of the harbor master. Again, you will need to still fill out all of the government paperwork and the fees that go with that. We talked about getting a permit to take on fuel, but is fuel expensive in the Galapagos? It definitely is expensive in the Galapagos. We paid $2 per liter uh, for the diesel that we ordered for Gargoyle. Um, it came to the boat, which is great. Um, so that service is there and available for anybody who's working for an agent, but definitely pricey. How do the locals treat tourists and yachts in the Galapagos? Uh, this is a good question. We've, we've been to some places where it appears that the locals don't really want you in their backyard. Uh, not the case in the Galapagos Islands. We've never felt more welcome uh, or made more new friends than we did in the Galapagos. So uh, you're treated almost as if you're island royalty when you show up on your boat. And we were literally the only yachties there, so 
everybody yeah. knew us. <laughs> that is that is true. <laughs> yeah. But what can I expect in the anchorages? And are there marinas or mooring balls that I can pick up? Uh, there are three anchorages in uh, Galapagos where private vessels are allowed to anchor, and that is Rec Bay, Port Aora, and Port Villamil. Um, Rec Bay and Port Villamil are great anchorages. Uh, you're usually in about 10 to 20 feet of water with really good holding. Um, our favorite was Port Villamil. Um, we were in 10 feet of water, great holding, limited surge. Um, and limited wind. Rec Bay tended to be very windy and um, there's a little bit of surge in Rec Bay. Our third and probably not favorite was Port Aora and the surge running through that anchorage was about two to three feet on certain days. Um, you're in 30 feet of water with great holding but you definitely need a stern anchor to keep the nose of your boat into the surge because it is super rough. So any of the mooring balls would be private and uh, there are no marinas as well. So you will definitely be anchored. Uh, so that when you are talking about these anchorages, is there one anchorage that you must report to when you first enter the Galapagos Islands? Yeah, the first port of calling has to be Rec Bay on San Cristobal. Uh, so work with your agent on that. Carla, do they have good services for yachts? Uh, their services in the Galapagos are limited. Um, they have mechanics because there's a lot of vessels that are there. Uh, the biggest issue is parts. So if you need specific parts for your boat, the Galapagos are probably not the place that you want to stop in. I am not a fan of sharks. So how did you feel when you were in the water with them? Were you scared of sharks? We've gotten that question a lot. So weren't you terrified? Actually, no, it surprised me. Um, we swam with hammerhead sharks at Kicker Rock and we swam with white tipped sharks, reef sharks at Bartolome. And I was pretty calm in both situations. Uh, maybe that's because there's more tourists in the water and I could swim faster so I knew they would get eaten <laughs> first. But um, I guess you just get used to it. The one thing that I have to say is the tour guides do an amazing job. The park rangers, they're in the water with you. They're pointing out wildlife. It is definitely a benefit when they're in the water um, because you see so much more and experience so much more because they're in their, in their backyard and they can show you everything that's underwater. One question that we've gotten quite a bit since we've released our videos has been about pets in the Galapagos Islands. So what is the rules about pets? Your pets have to remain on your vessel at all times. So when it comes to Samantha and Dean, they never leave our boat. Therefore, it's a non-issue. It is a extreme fine to the owner as well as the agent if an animal is taken ashore. So work with your agent to see if it is a possibility for you to bring your pet into the Galapagos Islands. What is the process when moving between the islands? You need to request uh, Zarpe to move between the islands and you need to allow 24 hours for that process. What we did find though was that the process shifted a bit while we were there. So check with your agent. You'll either get inspected upon arrival at a new island or prior to departure from the island that you are at. Uh, you'll see the port captain, uh, your representative from your agency will also be there. Uh, we also did have a doctor come and take our temperatures at one, one port. And then of course our life jackets and our fire extinguishers got more examinations than they've ever gotten in the last 18 months. Everyone wants to check those. Yeah, really high on safety requirements. Correct. Three different ports that you can sail to amongst the islands. What's it like sailing in the islands and anything that we would want people to be aware of? The largest issue to be aware of, because weather and wind are gonna just depend upon your day. We had some heavy wind days, we had some super light wind days, is the currents that run through the Galapagos. Um, it is part of the Pacific Equatorial Current, and it can run anywhere from a knot to three knots between some of the islands. So take a look at it, be aware that it's there, and then adjust your timing because there was a couple of ports that we pulled into in the dark and it was definitely not fun. 
got this question on a call the other night with some friends that are on a yacht and uh, they said that they've heard it is a real pain to go to the Galapagos because of all the regulations and the permits uh, and then the fact that you need guides for many of the locations. So is it really worth going on a private yacht? Definitely. That was easy. <laughs> uh, your agent helps you a lot in this. Um, the more pre-work you do, the easier the check-in is. And then as we had mentioned before, you speak with them on a daily basis and they are the conduit to your experience and how well it is in, in the Galapagos. But the people are super friendly. Like I said, the park rangers are amazing. The tours are amazing. Um, it, you know, I now know why it's on everybody's bucket list. And when you look at the cost that we encourage to go there and you compare that to two airplane tickets and potentially getting on a private vessel to go around the islands, it's actually really affordable. And most vacations to the Galapagos, you'll see people go for a week uh, because it is so expensive. We were moored in um, Wreck Bay next to several of the tour boats and we looked up online. Uh, they went for a week for $8,000 per person for the week. So very costly. And we were there for how long? Six weeks. Six weeks. We have covered off all of the questions that we've been asked by cruisers that we've run into. But if you have any comments or questions, please let us know down below. We'd also like to say a special thank you to Javier and his amazing team in the Galapagos Islands. Thank you. And we do have a Galapagos playlist with other videos of our experiences in the Galapagos. So please check it out and ciao for now. Every day when you're in... in when you're in... <laughs> Do it one more time. Balls being declined. De... What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Dean took all the questions away. Little turd. Hey Dean, we were going to wait for you. All the way up. No, no, no. <laughs> Can we let Dean stop licking his butt? Did you find a marine iguana in there? What did you find? Where's your fly?